All right, hello everybody. Making a video to archive the progression of this garden. We're now uh, November 2017. This was the um, okra. See, it's gone to seeds and I'm uh, just gonna let some of these seeds here fall on the ground. And I'm gonna collect some, but they, uh, they like to come back on their own, which is wonderful. All right, so um, I put in the title some, some clarifications that I wanted to make. Plus there's some new additions, but I'll be doing it all, all mixed up. You can't see this properly. This here's a new addition. And um, there's one here. And then there's a, a few here. Those are Jerusalem artichokes. And I got them at the uh, health food store and I soaked them for a bit. And then um, I just planted them here. They're perennials. And so you don't have to work so hard and they don't require nothing. You don't need um, to pamper them. This here's turmeric. I'm leaving this here just um, I'm not harvesting it it's gonna come back and it'll just keep coming back and it's a reserve if ever I should need some I've got some more down there now um, this year I planted some I actually got them from the side of the road these lantana lantana plants the butterflies love them so and they they were all like a foot to two feet high, small little plants I got on the side of the road. This is how they grew during the summer. And so I made like a, a hedge, a row here. Inside there is some lemongrass, the fig tree. It doesn't seem like it's doing good, but it was it was really amazing during the summer. We're like, we're almost in, we're in winter, so um, the trees have, are losing their leaves and stuff like that. There's a lot of strawberries here. The strawberries are coming back. Well, they, they, they were just like smothered by all of the other plants for a period of time. But there, everything else is going to like lose its leaves when it, there's a deep freeze. And then they're going to be back. Uh, king of the mountain, one could say. What you're seeing here, these beautiful plants with the uh, blue flowers, is chia. And I just tossed some chia here. And I did it really early. And this is a lesson learned. I'm going to share this little tip. If you put your chia really early on, it has many months to contend with the... Uh, the weather because I don't water I didn't water not once this area nor do I put any fertilizer which is which is going to require a uh, clarification because uh, my video I made on uh, no fertilizing triggered a lot of people so I need to clarify a few things but anyways if you plant your chia really early it will it will have to survive during many many months and the thing is this it only makes its flowers really late in the season it has to, it has to do with the the amount of light um, during the day you know the darkness and the light ratio and maybe temperature also but if you put it a bit later it won't matter so much because it'll grow and it'll put make its seeds no matter what these ones here I'm surprised they made it because it was really hot at one point during the summer and they all kind of like fell to the ground but then they started curving back up and somehow they made it and there is a lot I mean literally I don't know if you could see this here try to go slowly There's a lot of chia. I made a video 
on Chia last year. This year is full of bumblebees. Right now, you can't see it on this uh, video, but, and there's also uh, like a lot of butterflies and really a lot of bumblebees right now. This is wonderful. I mean, the wildlife love this stuff. And, and I like chia, so. <laughs> okay, um, while I walk to the other section, little clarification, I said that I don't use fertilizer, but that I, I use ramiel chipped wood. That's the small branches of a tree, a deciduous tree that are chipped and you mix it in the soil or you use it as a mulch. Now, it's called soil aggradation and, and, and I have all these people that have been debating saying it's a fertilizer, you're lying, you fertilize your garden. I mean, it's a play, we could play with words here, but um, if you take banana peels and apple peels and you take just stuff from from uh, that you uh, from your food plate in order to compost to make compost well the banana peel and the and the um, leftovers of your plate is not is not plant fertilizer once you compost it it becomes fertilizer but you have to compost it. If you just put a banana peel in the soil, the plants can't feed off a banana peel. It's the same with the wood chips. The wood chips are not fertilizer. As compared to if you buy a powder or a fish uh, liquid, something like an emulsion, uh, and, you, and you put the powder in the ground, that's directly used by the, uh, the plant. That's a fertilizer. The other one is, is the substrate, the food needed for the mushrooms to feed themselves, to feed other living beings, to create soil. It's called soil aggradation. But if you want to call it fertilizer, go ahead. But I'm just saying it's, it's soil aggradation and it's not technically speaking a fertilizer. So, um, I'll continue this little uh, explanation on fertilizer, but I want to show here what's going on. Now, bear in mind, this we're in fall, so this is not like the uh, thick growing season. What did I do different this year? This year, I, I let all of this area here, I let the wild plants take over during the, the dog days. Um, that's like here in the south it gets really really hot for like a month and a half and uh, things don't really grow very well so I let this huge mat this huge like it was big a lot I'll show you on the other side down there all of these wild plants grew a dense cover like almost like a cover crop and it shaded the soil here which was very good and it put a lot of roots a lot of root biomass went into the soil at the end of the dog days I took some clippers and I just cut all of these um, plants and I left the roots in the soil then I planted some things in there I put some seeds in there now before the season before those wild plants took over and I let them take over I put in some perennials because I don't want to have to work so hard every year so here's an example of some perennials this here is stinging nettle and it was I started it from seeds okay this is was a seed in like in spring and and it didn't do good because it was smothered by the wild plants what people call weeds <laughs> it was smothered but it didn't die it stayed there in the shade and it waited its turn and let me tell you boy is it happy now same goes with the bee balm i put some bee balm and i didn't even know it had survived i was just experimenting and look at it now it is doing really nicely okay and that's another perennial bee balm let me go and show you here this uh, stinging nettle. 
That is big. Okay, this is a huge stinging nettle. Well, I mean, for for its first year. All of these um, peppers, pepper plants, I put there before, and they were smothered, and they just reacted like as soon as the hot days were gone, and I took the um, the the cover crop, and which you could see here. It was this thing here, which is actually edible. And um, I forget the name, I think it's called Spurge or Spruge, something like that. It's not the one there that's, uh, that everybody talks about that is a creeping low one. It's, but anyways, it's controversial, but it, it is edible. And it was, it make, see how, how thick that was. But now it's dying off by itself, okay? And the things that were underneath are uh, coming back. Anyways, um, I also I put some echinacea, and um, it made it. And I didn't know, because I'm telling you, I could not see any of these plants at one point. It was a strange experiment that actually worked out. <laughs> and um, all of this jalapeno, more uh, balm, bee balm, came back. Didn't, well, it didn't die, it was just hidden for a while. Here's some more uh, stinging nettle. The same goes with these um, heirloom peppers that I put. They when I uh, they were smothered and they weren't producing anything, and now they're doing they're doing it now. See, uh, October it was when I took them out. October, November. <laughs> it's interesting. These are really hot. They're like a thousand or a hundred times hotter than jalapenos. <laughs> Caribbean uh, hot peppers. Now what you're seeing uh, intermixed with this here are heirloom, um, more nettle, more heirloom peppers. See, they're like the green peppers, but I mean, they're, but they're dark. They're this, this kind of heirloom. What you're seeing is like heirloom, uh, I, we only put heirlooms here, which is, uh, it's almost a misnomer. And again, you know, you have to do research to figure out what heirloom really means. But um, it doesn't mean that it's completely uh, wild genetics. Here's uh, some more of these, um, you see, turnips, see? I don't know if we could see here. This camera doesn't do well in the dark. It does very... Last year I got a lot of turnips and I got a lot of turnips this year too. Okay, so there's a few things now I need to say. In my practice of sacred gardening, it's an evolving practice and it's not about producing food to sell on the market. It's, it's to build a relationship basically with the plant world. Now, I mentioned that I've been slowly, my consciousness has been drifting towards eating more of the wild edibles and the medicinal plants. So I started gardening, gardening them and mixing them in with the heirlooms. Now, it, some people have been triggered and have really started to uh, say some nasty comments saying, you know, um, Wild edibles uh, are not nutritional, nutritional, nutritious, and um, there's nothing wrong with the hybridized genetics. They they've been bred by humans who knew what they were doing, and it's perfectly fine. And look, you have some in your garden, na na na, whatever. Yeah, I, I'm not saying that I'm only relying on wild edibles. <laughs> I'm saying that. I've discovered that the weeds are actually food and medicine, and I'm I'm gardening them. Okay, now, um, am I a hypocrite? I don't know. Like maybe, maybe you know, maybe I shouldn't talk about the difference between the genetic stock and just just show you guys how things could grow without without pampering the plants too much. This is um, turmeric. Okay, this goes in a section, lesson learned. What I learned, and what you're seeing here is the, the nicest 
patch that I had. It doesn't look nice now because it, it we're heading towards winter, but it was really, really nice and big and you know lush. And this here is basically, I did not purposefully wish this. It's last year when I harvested my turmeric, I cut all of the branches off, I took all the roots off, I cleaned them, and I had a lot, <laughs> so much. And, and all the small pieces that you know were left on the stalks of the plants, I kind of took all of that and all the leaves and the, the stems and I threw them here and that was going to be like some kind of compost pile. <laughs> and first thing I knew, plants were coming out of it. The small little pieces of turmeric rooted in, in here and I didn't till this, it's, I didn't do anything here and we're by this tree and I think, I think it loved to have the partial shade here during the hot parts and I never watered this. No, that's not true. I watered it twice because I was watering my um, tea tree. I put a tea tree and anyways, I, I, I gave it a bit because I wasn't sure if it was going to make it. The um, It didn't have like anything in there, not even the, the rat meal chipped wood. It was just there on the grass. <laughs> And it turned out it made the nicest, biggest turmeric. And the ones that I planted in here, which I made some nice fluffy beds for it, didn't do anything bigger than this. So I tried hard and it didn't work as well as not trying at all, which is a lesson learned. See, this is the same. This is just a, a piece, a leftover piece. So this year I'm gonna harvest it and I'm going to toss some pieces all around the trees and I might loosen up a little bit the grass, you know, but uh, I might, I mean, maybe there's a, there's a way to growing this here that you don't have to work so hard. And there's no fertilizer, there's nothing in here and it, they did great. Now let me show you here. This is some wild plants, the wild uh, mustard. And it looks like, you know, the regular mustard. And this here, I've been hoping for a long time to have some. I collected some seeds on the side of the road. I tossed them all over the place. I tried planting some, nothing came out. Only this came out. One plant last year, and now we're at three. And um, like I said in another video, this is the, uh, um, the genetic ancestor this wild mustard is the genetic ancestor of kale, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, broccoli, all of all of these, uh, and there's some more also like um, Swiss chard. A lot of uh, what we call food comes from tweaking the genetics of this, but this is the original. And, and it's really, really, really good. I, not, I'm not going to say I could argue scientifically that it has more or less nutrition. It's not about the chemicals that nutritionists talk about. There's a lot more to nature that we don't understand. There's a lot more to food. There's a lot more to human health than materialistic science is capable of understanding. So I don't want to get into these debates, but I know I've triggered a lot of people. Boy. Okay, so this here is the wild amaranth. It's, it, it's sec it comes twice here in the south. It grows in spring, puts some seeds out, and then it puts the seeds down, and these germinate and make a second crop. You have two crops. They are delicious to eat. This here is wild edibles. If you look up on the nutrition according to the guidelines of the USDA or the, the food pyramid and what, you know, they talk about proteins, amino acids, vitamins, minerals, all that, blah, blah, blah. This certainly competes according to that definition, but it also has the wild genetics that were uh, summoned by creation and the process of creation. Someone gave me this tea tree. This is the true tea, like, you know, the tea, like tea leaves, like when you drink tea. Um, 
it's just starting to do something. Look at all of this here. This is all those that beautiful cover crop that protected the soil during the hot, hot period. And um, the mint, I have put some chocolate mint here and it had disappeared for a while and it's coming back now. It was protected. I did not have to water anything because of, of these quote protective weeds. The um, oregano, there's some basil, but um, I'm definitely going to be um, doing more of this cover crop during the summer here. Let me show you the butterfly plant. That was a lesson learned. Um, lesson learned, this beautiful butterfly plant. I put it here because it's a perennial and the, the, the person at the nursery said, look, confirmation that butterflies like it. Oh no, I scared the butterfly. <laughs> well, the butterflies like the lantana and the butterfly plant. Okay, so the person said, oh, you'll see the seeds. They'll spread and you'll have this everywhere. And I was like, really? Great. <laughs> Here's the seeds. Okay, and um, last year it didn't spread, but this year, that's, that's one, that's one. All of these, all of these are all butterfly plants. It's all over the place. I just need to take the ones I want and put them somewhere else. I could create a huge butterfly area with this stuff. I'm going to leave a lot of them just there. I mean, this is going to be like so beautiful <laughs> like next year. Man, these things, they come back. They, the frost kills it and you're like, oh, it's gone. Uh-uh, it comes back by itself. You don't need to do anything. I'm going to show you... Um, Try to grow some tomatoes here. Tomatoes don't want to grow, like not here. The, the basil did great. These are basil, the seeds. Um, I'm gonna harvest some, but I'm hoping it'll come back. I did the same cover crop here. Here I didn't take the cover crop off yet. I'm gonna do it before these go to seed and drop the seeds. I'm actually just gonna cut them and lay them there as a, as a mulch. This area was left completely wild. Um, I didn't plant a lot of stuff in here during the summer. I wanted to give this, this area a break. Ginger, I, tr I figured I would put it in some partial shade. Lessons learned. This ginger did much, much better than the ginger I put in the full sun. I unearthed some to show you here. Let me go in the uh, in the sun. Okay, here's some ginger. Now, I had never had fresh ginger before this year. Again, I bought this ginger at the store, at the food store. You know, you go to the food store, you buy ginger, and if you're lucky, it'll like your place. And let me tell you something, fresh ginger, like this here, is not uh, fibrous, like you could cut it up, it's almost like cutting butter, it's like butter, hard butter or something. It's like a, like a, a creamy, like more creamy. It is so good, oh, and that'll come back by itself. So I'm going to just harvest half of that and leave the other half. The more of these, these love it here. Uh, this is it for me, you know, jalapeno and these Caribbean peppers. And I keep the seeds every year. They love it. They love it here. Okay, I have to try to go a bit faster. I don't want to make this video too long. I want to show you Jerusalem artichoke. I had three patches here. I just basically tore the grass up, made a, made a round, put some uh, little pieces of roots. I harvested these already and we've been eating some. Here's one patch of the grass, like, blah, blah, it took over. And, um, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, grass or not. 
So here's what it looks like. I um, unearthed a piece. I have to be careful. There's a lot of uh, ants here. This is what it looks like. Jerusalem artichokes. See, uh, see they, they grow out through the, the roots like that and they make these tubers like this here. Now, let me see in the sun. These are, are perennials, so they come back and the, and the plant spreads like crazy. And they're, they taste like um, very, very creamy potatoes, but they have their own taste. They're delicious. These things like are, um, they're a luxury. You go into like some posh restaurants and you get some Jerusalem artichokes. If they're cooked properly, they don't give so much gas and they're really, really delicious. Um, and this here like was just two three pieces and right now it's full of it in there and next year it's gonna be even full even more you just take half of it leave half of it in there um, so and it spreads it spreads it spreads you don't need to do anything I didn't have water that I didn't put any quote fertilizer nothing I just I just opened a piece in the grass you know um, regarding fertilizer, I want to do here a um, clarification. I'm not saying that you can't fertilize, that you should not, not fertilize. I'm saying I'm experimenting by using ramiel chipped wood and or not using it, just just letting the wild plants grow in there, die there, letting all the bugs, everything, and seeing what happens. And I'm saying some of the plants that have strong genetics that are still linked to creation, when I say that I'm saying plants that are like like the wild plants they don't need anything they grow to perfection they make flowers and they come back and they make their babies and they come back they don't need human pampering most of our food comes from an or, from an original source like that the original source doesn't need pampering some plants are closer to that so that's what i'm trying to figure out um and uh they take more time to grow to their to whatever it is that you require from them. They could take twice as long, but they make it. You have to be patient. Some and some don't. And the point is this, if some plants don't make it, okay, you're looking at some chia here. This here is a, a, a lot of chia. And uh, boy, whoo! <laughs> so the point is that um, there are certain things like some some hybrids of corn or some tomatoes, uh, cabbage. There's like the, I I could make a list of the things that they won't do very well if you don't put some type of fertilizer. Some I call it like Franken food, like plant Franken food for these Franken genetics. You got these huge unnatural corn, gen this corn genetics. Of course it needs the cow manure or it needs something. It's not normal per se. It needs, it needs an extra hand, okay? It's like if we would be breeding all these super, super six foot, five muscled you know human beings well they might need more nutrition than if someone was just not genetically enhanced you know to keep that muscle mass so so if you want to grow some certain things do fertilize but that's not what i want to be doing here so i'm i'm, I'm trying to uh i'm experimenting with something else okay this here i basically i tilled at the beginning of the summer then I mounded it all and I put in some seeds of comfrey. I put in some uh, stinging nettle, some bee balm. So you're looking at some stinging nettle mixed in with some bee balm. Okay. 
mixed in with some comfrey. Now this comfrey is big. I, I don't know, I can't really, you can't really relate, but this is one year of growing. Now, if you know anything about comfrey, you know that I could take this plant out and cut the roots up and maybe have 50 plants like this next year by just putting these pieces of these roots everywhere. Comfrey is medicinal and um, they say that you can't eat it, but that's, I don't believe it. Some people have been, do eat this. They say it has too much protein, too much nitrogen. And that's why it's also used as a um, as a mulch and used in the compost to help make a better compost and to help bring fertility to the soil. Okay, so it it has roots that goes really deep in in and takes the nutrients from deep in the soil and pulls the nutrients back up into the leaves and then the leaves fall on the ground and it and then the microorganisms can break it down and then the plants could eat whatever the organisms produced and it cycles the nutrients there rather than the nutrients being leached uh, by the rain into the mineral soil down to the uh, the layer of the clay down there look at all this nettle it's a lot of nettle and uh, comfrey so this um, bee balm, lesson learned, bee balm, comfrey, nettle, they have a strong spirit. Because I also started seeds of yarrow, chamomile. This year I, I started I think like 12 different types of herbs. And these are the three that I would say lesson learned. They just... You, boy, the other ones, like I only found one or two of them that actually made it. The chia has a very strong spirit. It, it, like, see, I don't water this, and uh, and so it doesn't mind the drought. So, this here is a eucalyptus tree. I don't know, I don't have any lessons learned. But I, I, I sure wish I did because it didn't do so good. I watered it. <coughs> I don't know. It could be like the shock. This is like the first year that I planted. It could be under shock. More of the chia, the nettle, the comfrey. You got to know that I'm going to continue propagating this comfrey everywhere here and other places in the garden and I'm going to be using it which will be next year's um, lessons learned. See what happens when I use that hmm, as a mulch or as a, as a tea because there's some, uh, like I said, I'm experimenting with trying to eat more and more of the wild edibles. But it doesn't mean that we we do have things like we want to be eating like um, like my uh, um, like my friend likes kale and peppers, green peppers, heirloom peppers, carrots, things like that. They uh, they might uh, require more nutrients because some of them like the the beets um, the beets aren't doing good if you don't put anything. I would have thought beets had a stronger spirit, but they don't. Um, this here is peanuts, and I'm letting the peanuts come back. They're perennials, okay, and the, all of these um, are going to uh, re-sprout next year. I did harvest some, um, so I can put some seeds in uh, some new fresh peanuts, but this is a third year, so um, I keep I keep peanuts every year and um, this is a mix of seeds I just toss in there. I had some extra heirloom seeds of different greens I just tossed them here and uh, I did this mat. It's interesting. Okay gotta speed this up. I, I only have like an hour. This was um, okra and so I put some, I tossed some okra seeds here. I tilled this lane and um, I wanted to grow edamame. Lesson learned, edamame 
nope that's a soya and it was organic seeds supposedly soy i thought you know soy it's a it's a legume it should be able to have its own uh nitrogen fixation stuff it shouldn't need any pampering <coughs> it didn't do anything but i had tossed in some okra just you know for safe measure to have something the okra grew like crazy and i had more okra this year i my freezer is full of okra right now and I'm, let, I'm just gonna let all the seeds fall on the ground here and uh, see, uh, they're all gonna come back next year by themselves. Now, I came here because I wanted to show you, this is a new addition, um, that was a lesson learned, this is a new addition. Every year, I learn more about these beautiful weeds. Now this year, last year I had no idea existed. It was probably here, it's just, when you don't know about uh, a plant, it's like it escapes your uh, your consciousness, your, your perception. This is called ironweed. It's called um, Sida, S-I-D-A. There's a few different names for it. Um, it's very hard to get out of the ground, which means it probably has a deep root <clears throat> and if you look up, it makes these yellow flowers. They're all like bundled up right now. But uh, if you read up on this Sida, S-I-D-A, iron, iron uh, weed, you'll be amazed of all of the uh, medicinal properties that this plant has. Um, and it's really... It's really good to eat. You eat the leaves just like this here. Mmm. It's... It melts in your mouth, okay? It is so delicious and has a good taste. It's not bitter at all. Now, these and wild amaranth are all over this place, everywhere here. And, and I'm, I'm telling you, go look at the medicinal properties of this uh, ironweed. It's unbelievable. It's like treats, I think, like 10 different things, including severe bacterial infections. I mean, and, and, and just like, it's mind boggling. And, and I used to think it was just a weed, you know, like, well, I don't think that anymore, but I mean, a long time ago, this was just weeds. Here I put in some sweet potatoes. This is a third year. All I did is three years ago, I tilled the lane. I p took some, I put mulch. I put some ramule chipped wood as mulch. Maybe I put a, a foot or three quarters of a, of a foot of thick mulch. Put some sweet potatoes in it. They grew. Then the next year, when I harvested, I mixed in that mulch on top of it. So the mulch was mixed with the soil. So the ramule chip wood was mixed inside the soil. Then the second year I mulched it again with just a little bit of uh, wood chips. And then I mixed that in. This year I just harvested and uh, it wasn't so much mulch. I'm uh, running out of wood chips, huh? but you could still see this. There's like a, a mix of wood chips here, and I'm going to show you a little bit closer here. I just uh, dug this up to show you a little bit. These are the uh, sweet potatoes. They're all sorts of sizes. You know, like some are bigger, some are smaller. Like this guy here. This is my hand. So, so the sweet potatoes, okay, without any fertilizer, I don't put manure, I don't put anything in here, except that the uh, ramule chipped wood is now mixed in the soil. And so let me show you what happens when you do that. Uh, hopefully we could see here. Can you see this here? That, that, is not a plant that's inside the soil okay look 
Okay, that is ba Basiomycetes. That's that's a, a fungus that that decays wood, that breaks down the lignin of wood. Okay, and this one is white. There's also one that is brown. The one that is brown breaks down. Um, softwood like pine like con coniferous the white one breaks down the deciduous wood chips two types of basiomycetes brown rot and white rot this here is the key to the uh, for to the uh, soil aggradation process what some people call fertilizer wood chips are not fertilizer wood chips are the food for this this guy okay this eats this breaks down the wood chips which I've already mentioned lignin is uh, the constituent of wood is a molecule a complex molecule aromatic molecule which means the molecule is like carbon in a like I think it's a hexagonal shape and all the carbons are held tightly by an electron that is shared by the carbon and that holds these carbons that are in a ring really tightly really tightly nothing can break that down except for this here the basiomycetes mushroom it breaks down the wood chips once it breaks down the lignin that energy that is stored in there is freed and that is like the sun inside of here is freed and now a cascade of living organisms there's a cascade that will ensue from breaking down this wood chip that life will start to emerge because one organism will feed on the mushroom or on the the chemicals that are broken down from the lignin and that will will grow in size and numbers and which will feed something else which will feed something else that's a cascade all these things are pooing and so that is also part of, of bringing the fertility they're dying their little bodies are dying in here and being eaten and then and then whatever chemicals are left behind are in there it is the life the living beings that in the chain here that are creating soil and it starts with the wood chips because the wood chips is a is organic is like organic matter okay in which is stored carbon and the energy of the sun that's how I see it. I say the energy of the sun. I see this like almost like some um, uh, materialized manifestation of the sun energy, which is food. <laughs> Ultimately, energy is is what we're after. There's just different ways to to har harness and harvest the energy. So, lesson learned here: uh, potatoes, sweet potatoes, they do great. I mean, I don't know how well they would do without the wood chips and um, the ramule chipped wood, which is not tree trunk. A tree trunk would not work. It needs small branches and you need to inoculate the branches with the mushrooms and it has to be deciduous. It's like, you know, it's not just wood chips. It's like complicated. At the same time, it's not complicated, but it is and it isn't. Um, that um, the lesson learned is you don't really need the manure and all that stuff, uh, fertilizer, chemicals. If you have a wood chipper, or if you're patient and you take twigs and you cut them down into small pieces and you incorporate them in the soil. Um, I'm not saying I know people will be triggered they'll be triggered they'll be like well there's nothing wrong with chemical fertilizers okay sure go ahead use it I'm not saying that you can't use it this is an experiment um, 
of trying to not pamper too much and trying to uh, be in sync with more of the natural processes of this ecosystem. I'm in a matrix, a forest. Technically, this should be a forest. So, um, the fertility of the soil here is uh, forest driven. It's not a closed system, this. It's an, this garden is an open system. It's, it's nested inside of the forest matrix, okay? <clears throat> um, this is a uh, Soho's. If you study Soho's, like self organizing holarchic systems, they're open systems but nested one each inside of each other. A lot of people like to talk about how their farm is a closed living organism. I'm sorry, it's not. It's nested into something and there's energy trans transfer between the systems. This is what you could utilize the forest, the forest into the garden. They're linked. They should actually be more linked, but um, this is the linking of the... I don't know what this is, but this is my plan for next year to make friends with this here. It makes these beautiful like, like Chinese lanterns. Let me see. If I could stop moving, you see, you're probably saying, stop moving. Beautiful, like these beautiful lanterns. This here grew, and I'm showing you this because lessons learned was a failure. Well, it's not really a failure, but I put here some uh, peas, yellow Mexican beans. They grew a little bit and they all died. And I don't know what happened. Uh, this was grass that I tilled. I thought these beans, Cow peas, the cow peas do well, but this yellow Mexican bean, I don't remember what it's called. I have it at home. I actually bought the, bought the seeds at Walmart. <laughs> they're supposed to be heirloom. It's a, uh, they're coming back on the market. They tried to uh, eliminate them. Um, I'm not sure if it's this, this uh, businessman who owns uh, the patent, who owns the right to yellow beans, wanted to get rid of these Mexican heirloom yellow beans. And I figured I would plant them out here, but it, they didn't work. They're delicious though. All right, so um, there's other things I wanted to show, but I don't remember now. But anyways, this is it. This is a recap of the year, 2017. Lessons learned, um, new additions, the comfrey, all these beautiful medicinal plants that are going to be enhancing the, uh, the soil fertility so that I could grow things that um, need some pampering because I'm not 100% eating wild edibles and medicinal herbs. They're slowly, I'm slowly merging what we call food, what we call weeds, what we call medicinal plants, wild edibles. I'm slowly wrapping it all up into one, th one concept, one, one system that will be garden a certain way which I call sacred gardening, but that has triggered a lot of people too. They figure, you know, if it, oh, the sacred, they have their definition of sacred, and then they're like, how could you say you're sacred if you do this? You helped this old lady get her organic certification, the USDA corrupt certification, that's not sacred, <clears throat> you're being a hypocrite. There's all sorts of, look at the nasty comments that I get uh, in my YouTube. I've started to delete some. I'm sorry if you're uh, in the, if you've been, your comments been deleted. It's just that I'm, I just can't handle it. I get emotionally involved, like, and then um, it affects me, you know, these negative comments. So sometimes I delete them because or else I, I, I respond and that's not good. This here is pokeweed. Uh, poke. Look at this here. 
it's it's amazing. It used to be uh, it, it used to be a dye. <laughs> this is gonna stay stain on my hands for a while. Poke is uh is used in tinctures and uh, you could um, it's a blood purifier that's what they say I have a friend that takes a berry eats one berry every two weeks and at the end of the the year says that that was enough medicine for uh, to do the job I tried eating some leaves <clears throat> and they um, they were uh, they did something to my uh, my ganglions in my throat. <laughs> I don't know what, but they were like poking away at it. Poke, poke, poke. I was like, oh, that's why they call it poke. <laughs> but you're supposed to like, uh, if you cook this to eat it, you're supposed to toss away the water. And I didn't. I figured, yeah, if it's medicinal, I'll have a little bit. And so look at that. Isn't this amazing? Beautiful color. Might try staining some shirts with it. So there you go. Um, this is uh, the end of 2017. I hope that you're uh, learning stuff at the same time as I'm learning stuff and that we're navigating through this huge experiment together. All right, send me your comments, but not too much uh, of your nasty comments. All right, bye-bye, take care.